you're watching the top six show, the original multi-club fan channel. Make sure you're following us now on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. The link is in the description below. We have got an explosive top six show for you today. The Qatar takeover. Is it imminent? They, the 9-2 UK holdings, have launched their UK company. Reuters confirm that Man United are negotiating granting exclusivity to the uh, Sheikh Jassim's consortium. And they state that they are now seen as a more favorable bidder than the British billionaire Sir Jim Ratcliffe. We're talking about the second bid for Declan Rice from Arsenal. Man City's pursuit. Who is going to land him? Caicedo to Chelsea. That is seen as the most favourable deal, but it's been announced in the last 10 minutes that Arsenal are not out of that race, yes, and Man United are continuing to push. We're also going to look at Kai Havertz maybe leaving Chelsea and joining Arsenal as well, plus taking any questions that you've got. Um, we're t- touching Tottenham as well with their £50 million bid for Barnes and uh, James Madison. Many people believing that to be a little bit disrespectful, but make sure the like button has been hit. Make sure you're all subscribing. Make sure the bell notification is turned on as well. But my panel is here with me. How are we all doing this afternoon? Are we all good? Oh, great. Couldn't be happier. Couldn't be happier, bro, honestly. <laughs> like Christmas, New Year, my birthdays all come at once. <laughs> and, we, and we will. And we will be getting on to that. Uh, but I wanted to start off with the Man United takeover. As I mentioned at the top, there's been so much today. Rio Ferdinand saying that his sources say it's imminent. The stock market three days running continues to grow off the back of the fake story three days ago. That's strange. Now, Roy has claimed they're the favourites. The holding company in the UK has been created. The British media seem to be working very hard to debunk it. As I will add, working very hard to debunk it. It's gone from that's not true to we don't know if it's true in the space of an hour. But from your point of view, uh, Neeks, talk to me about your personal feeling about all this news and the takeover today. Oil me up, baby. Oil me up. <laughs> it's a, it's good news today, isn't it? It's good news. Good weather. Good news. I can't complain. Uh, Lewis says Christmas come early. It must be Eid for Man United fans. It's been brilliant, isn't it? Um, <laughs> you see, you know what it is. Obviously, we heard that the news that people often don't. You see a headline, and you you kind of read or see what you want to see. Um, but what is stated from what the news we heard is that the Man United are, and obviously the 90 Foundation are asking to for, for a period of exclusivity, so obviously that no one else can bid, and they're in this negotiation. Now, also reports since then from like Simon Stone, for example, says that it's been rejected. But for me, that's whilst you think, ah, oh, damn, it's been rejected, which means other people can come in for an offer. For me, it's good news that the negotiations took place in the first place, or the, at least the proposal was put forward in the first place. Because I think last week we were talking about final bid from the 92 Foundation, not willing to enter any more negotiations, um, frustrated and pot- potentially going to walk away. The fact that they are offering or they're wanting to enter a period of, of exclusivity, whether it's accepted or not, it tells me that they are very, very serious and intent on gaining ownership of Manchester United. Now, that may be on the back of where, in, you know, last week that um, Al-Khalifi spoke to, you know, Sheikh Jassim, etc. And I, I think, I was saying on Saeed's channel last week, I think Qatar as a nation have a big interest in someone from Qatar owning Manchester United for, for their own uh, growth around the world, especially in the sporting ventures. So, the fact that they are they are trying to enter this period of, of exclusivity, whether it's accepted or not, for me, says they are intent on only Man United. And I think considering their wealth, if they are that hell bent on only Man United, I'm, I'm more confident than not that it's going to end up in their hands. And, and that for me, that's good news. I thought about it more and like since this morning and I'm thinking, I have a different thinking about this. I think... If they were confident about their bid being accepted, as we heard three days ago, fake news, they would not have asked for exclusivity. They would be confident that the bid is the highest, that nobody can compete with us, that we are winning this bid. But for one reason or the other, they are asking about exclusivity, which is going to 
prevent anybody else from entering the negotiation unless they present a higher bid. I don't know how to interpret that. I'm not a financial expert, but, but I just you know, kept, I but, kept reading about it, Nix. I kept reading. And the exclusivity means that you uh, really want to sit at the table with them and talk face to face. But but that's but that's yeah. the whole point. That's the point, isn't it? What what the what both bidders both bidders want this. If you actually read the full story, there's it looks like both are asking for an element of exclusivity because once that's granted, it puts the glazers in a corner essentially to sit and negotiate with us. And let's, let's either find a final price or end this situation. What the Glazers have now done five times is got five bids out of these potential new owners. And they want to stop that. And they want to get down to owning the club because the transfer window is opened. They want to get in. They want to clear debts. They want to start setting up their own situation and start to improve Manchester United. And every week that goes by makes it harder for us to, to have the best first summer possible whether it's the gym or all the Qatari owners and and and, and uh, Sheikh Jazim. So, look, I think from from my point of view, all these stories are great, and I know that that, that Ben Jacobs and a few others and Simon Stone have kind of come out and, and poured a little bit of cold water upon it. But as if stated, as Ben stated on my show just yet uh, yesterday Tuesday, sorry, these claims might end up being right, but it's not what I've been told at this moment in time. Reuters are not a sports publication. It's business, so they're not reporting on it from a sports angle whatsoever. And there's two things that stand out. The launching of the holding company. Now, there's talk that it's taken two months to get done. Nonsense. I started a brand new limited company last week. It took less than 24 hours to register it and get it uploaded. And that's silly old little me. I'm sure the Qatari, you know, the, the lawyers and the people surrounding them are pretty good at form forming, forming, uh, you know, for, uh, formulating a business. The next element is the stock for the share price. Because of a fake news story, according to the mainstream British media, the share price rose. Then why is it stabilized every day and growing for three days running? These stock market experts and these brokers and these investors, they're not going to throw money at a project that they have no faith is going to yield a, a financial return. If it gets announced tomorrow that Sir Jim's going to be the new owner, the share price is going to plummet and they're going to lose lots of money. So I'm not saying it's a guarantee the Qataris are going to get the ownership and it's going to happen tomorrow. But it's, these things are all positive indicators. And what I find interesting is how the cold water is being thrown on it so quickly. Where is most of that information coming from? In my opinion, it's coming from the rain group and the glazers who don't want this process to end quickly because they want to continue to try and get the price higher. It's certainly interesting the way this is panning out as far as I'm concerned. But, you, know, yeah, I'm, I'm, you guys are not concerned that what, what, maybe... What, 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 I wanted to comment on, on, on Terry at one point, sorry. Oh. You guys are not worried that now they ask for this exclusivity that they're fed up? That no, it's see, now or never? It's now or never? Like, sit with us now or we're not continuing this? I, I don't think it's now or never. Um, and I've said it from, from the jump, to be honest. I don't think all these deadlines we always heard, deadline from the Glazers and Rain Group, deadline from the, um, to get a response for the bid, deadline, deadline. There have been five bids since the first deadline. There is no deadline. If if tomorrow Sir Jim comes with a offer of uh, a, a half a billion more, the Glazers aren't going to say, "Oh, you missed the deadline." Yeah. And if if, yeah. if if the week after um, Jasim comes with a, a half a billion or more than that, they're not going to say, "Oh, sorry." The no, the, there is no deadline. The deadline is when the bid is accepted and the club is uh, well. You're pretty much when the bid is accepted officially. But what I was going to say is that we have to also remember that as much as yes they've got more money than God, um, the, the Qataris. It it doesn't mean that they want to be feel like they've been fleeced, like they've been overpriced. I think they probably feel already the price is too much. But if it was a case, ah, oh, we've got all this money, don't really care, we'll just bid 10 billion and get over and done with in February, they would have done that. But I'd, I think them wanting exclusivity so no more bids can come in over a certain period of time and or to get, to get the the deal actually over the line as soon as possible. I don't think that should be viewed negatively. I think that's what any real business person would do because why would you want to pay or risk paying 7 billion for something that you can pay 6 billion for? Whether you've yeah. got 20 billion or 20 trillion, you don't no, want to pay, pay, pay more than you have to. And on top of that, a few people in the comments are saying, but they already said now or never, that was very quickly debunked by about six different outlets from the UAE, the Middle East, and Qatar collectively, they all came out and said they've been used by this. They've never done that. They want to win, win this race. And 
Look, yeah, I, to answer your question, Mo, I'm, I'm not concerned about that at all. For me, they need to start pushing. Now, it's been rejected because the Glazers, according to Simon Stone, to try and move, keep the situation alive. The Glazers only care about one thing and one thing only, and that's making as much money as possible. But what's also helping is that the loans and the bonds that Sir Jim needs to buy the club are not easily gettable at this moment in time in the financial world, which is all very boring to fans. So there's no guarantee that they'll get it now and no guarantee of more money in the future to buy out their remaining shares, which is making the, the Qataris a more favorable bid. That news has been reported by Bloomberg, by Reuters, and there was one other outlet. I think it might have been FT, the Financial Times. Every sports broadcaster in the world has swept that under the rug very quickly, which is strange to me as to why they would ignore that from three of the most credible credible business outlets in the world. But we will see. There's a super one chat. Thing, one thing so, I'll say, Terry, just go on, go on, go on. Go on. No, no, um, go on. Yeah, not yeah. About yeah. One, one thing I'll say, um, just from a rival point of view, of course, I, I don't want United to get Qataris, of, of course, right? But just reading between the lines, recently the Glazers asked the president of PSG to go back to the Qataris and basically ask them to, to raise their bid, right? So surely if Sir Jim was the number one option, they would have had that wrapped up already. So how I'm looking at it now, I just think it's a, he's yeah. a bit of a ploy to get more money out of the out of the Qataris. That's how I'm looking at it now, just logically, because after that happens, there's been a lot of news now about exclusivity and quite a lot of conflicting reports. But just that key point there for me is what's kind of changed my view in it a little bit more, I would say. The fact that they were actually reaching out to them for them to offer more money. Um so yeah. it's looking likely that the Qataris are going to get it in all no, I, I, I do. I, I do feel like like Sheikh Jazim and his consortium are going to be the preferred. Uh, but I thought that for a while. Go back to the videos when every other Man United content creator was getting their bum crack out, parting their cheeks and crying over it not being the Sheikh. I said the whole time, I'm, I'm still really confident. I just don't see this man, this individual from the region of the world he's from, losing this type of battle publicly. Equally, though, they're not going to be seen. Even if, listen, if they pay six, if they pay seven billion, they will claim it six. You know, th these things, it's like transfers. Some you'll get one club say, Oh, we, we paid 100 billion. The selling club will say 110. Why do they do that? Because everybody wants to look like they win in these circumstances. But we'll see what happens with it. It's going to, it feels like it might progress pretty quickly from here. But who knows? We've been in this position before and then it's regressed again. But I do see a lot of the comments saying, RIP football, Terry, you're going to lose your club. Man United lost their club in, in 2005, 2004, 2005 when this happened. We've been rotting and eroding away for the past decade since Sir Alex Ferguson left. So um, forgive me, I do not think football's going to die. We've had Middle East owners take PSG. We've had Sheikh Mansour at Man City. And by the way, all of you were very happy to banter me and my club the other day when they did a treble. There was no football's dead when Man City won their treble. When, when oil money came in from Roman Abramovich, that was going to destroy football. That was 20 years ago, and it's, it's at the peak of its powers right about now. Newcastle have had this takeover. And strangely, football didn't die. It's still here. So I'm not going to be dragged into some weird moral argument over Man United are about to kill football. No. All it's going to do is more investment. Man, all you're worried about really is Man United getting back to the peak of their powers. That's all the fear comes down to. Drop your fake moral outrage because I'm not listening to it here because I bet you'll all still drink Starbucks and fly on an aeroplane and use an iPhone. So until you stop doing all of that, I don't want to hear any of your nonsense. Um, another thing about Man United I want to ask you about football-wise, Man United pulling out, I want to go to um, a gal on this, Man United pulling out of the Harry Kane situation. What, what do you make of that? They're not going to put a bid in. They're not going to waste any time trying to buy him. Correct decision from him. And what do you make of Harry Kane not forcing this move? I, I personally think it's just Daniel Levy is difficult to deal with. And every, anyone who comes to the table just quickly realizes that this guy's illogical, somewhat delusional prices that he puts on players. And he, he's just unrealistic to work with uh, on a footballing level. So I don't, I don't put it down to Manchester United. I put it down more to Tottenham and putting a ridiculous price tag to Harry Kane at the age that he's at. And I question Harry Kane's, I question Harry Kane's ambition as a player. If he wants to stay at Tottenham for the rest of his career, if he signs another contract at Tottenham, where does he want to go? Does he want to be remembered as the guy who was who, who the greatest to never win? Does it does is that what he wants to be known as? Because even even going to Manchester United will at least secure you some domestic trophies and potentially uh, if they get the Qatari takeover, you could be one of the faces of that club. 
But hey, he wants it right away at Tottenham. I, I put it down to Daniel Levy and, and, and I question Harry Kane's ambition, Terry. I, I agree. But Brandon, you want to say something, bro? Go on. Oh, I'm sorry. Harry Kane's a loser. It's plain as simple as that. Um, at the end of the day, right, why would you want to stay at Tottenham with the mess that they're in now? I know they've got a new He wants manager. to be a Tottenham legend. That's what he wants. A Tottenham yeah, legend. Daniel, that's a, that's, exactly. that, that's, what, that's, that's a bit unfair nothing, to say, right? though. That's a bit unfair but, to say, though, because it's not it's not Kane saying he wants to stay. It's Levy, like a guy yeah, just said, yeah, being a pain. That's get, why they pulled out. Okay, okay. But let me get my let me get to my point, right? Has, has Harry Kane handed in a, a transfer request? No. Has he made any form of like kicking up a fuss or anything like that to leave Tottenham? No. So that tells me everything that I need to know. You know, like it looks like he's going to remain at Tottenham. We all know that Daniel Levy is difficult to deal with. And, you know, if you, you're that set on leaving, then unfortunately you have to grow some balls and hand in a transfer request. And that's how it works at Tottenham. But, you know, if he, st- if he remains at Tottenham, then again, I, I, I agree with Agel. You have to question this guy and his mentality. And, you know, because they're in a rebuild, they're not going to be back at the top anytime soon. Um, and by that time, you know, this guy's going to be ending his career. So I, I have to question Harry Kane and his mentality as a player. And you want to know something? Manchester United gets a pass. No, because you we know Tottenham are terrible. Uh, at doing deals with and we know Harry Kane has has turned down and moved to Man City so it's not like it's the first rodeo we've seen so you guys get a, you guys get a pass on this one you, you see me I think if, if Harry Kane signs a new deal then yeah I agree completely with both of you two in terms of questioning his mentality I can question his mentality five, I don't know, five years ago when he signed a six-year deal whatever it might have been um, at the time and you can say mm, why did you do that at the time but what we've seen since then is that he has tried to leave Spurs. When Man City um, put in a bid of near enough 120 million there or thereabouts, he went on strike, wasn't there for pre-season, didn't turn up to training until the season started, and then he joined up with the squad when he realised Man City were not going to reach, I think it was the 150 million price tag that Levy had on his head. Now, if Man United this summer said, we are putting in you know, we guaranteed Harry Kane, we are going to put in a bid, like Man City did, we're going to put in a substantial bid for you this summer, maybe he'll do the same thing. But he knows that even when that happens, like he did a, a, a couple of years ago, there's no guarantee that Levy's still going to sell until his price tag is met. So for me, I can't question Harry Kane's mentality at the, as it stands this summer for Levy not accepting a reasonable bid. I can only really question it if he decides to sign a new contract. You have to say, well, yeah. you have real no ambition. But yeah. I think it's, it's on Levy for me. Levy's uh, holding yeah. all the cards. And... I, I think from Man United's point of view, we're doing the right thing. Let's step away. Let's look at other options. Oh, 100%. I, I think we're looking at this this, this um, uh, Hoyland, who, look, he, he's good for now, could be brilliant in the future. Let's wait and see what happens, though, should our takeover go through. They're saying Man United have only got about $125 million available this summer. They said we only had 100 million last summer. And I think if the takeover goes through, remember, they pay the debt off, which gives us 50 million pound extra. That's what we pay each year in debt. There'll be no dividends being taken. So that's another 35, 25 to 35 million pound in, in, the, in the club. And they can pump 100 million pound of their own money into transfers instantly. So you're looking before a player is even sold at nearly 300 million, uh, sorry, 200 million additional if they take us over. So let's just take the, 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 the fee that, the media have said is right, 125 million. Add nearly 200 million more to that if the Qataris get us, plus what we sell. If that takeover happens, it could be anywhere as high as 400 million to spend. Then we can, re- then I think maybe I might, might go back in for him, but I think we're right to waste no time on it now. Move on to other targets, get that done and dusted because we are going to get onto this more when we talk Chelsea in a bit, but the, the league doesn't start for two months. But in three weeks' time, our clubs will start their preseason training. Preseason games start in under two in, in under a month for a lot of our clubs. So business needs to start happening soon because all our managers are going to want the best starts possible. And I think that's right for us to focus on that um moving forward. But yeah, look, it's a um it, it's it's a it's a it's a real difficult one um with Harry Kane. But I agree with you, Neeks. If he signs a new deal at Tottenham, I'm gonna stop calling him good. 
I'm going to ignore his actual quality as a footballer and just focus on his mentality and call him a loser. Because staying there, imagine staying at Tottenham your whole career, never winning a trophy, never touching silverware, never having a medal. You saw what it meant to West Ham when they won. You saw the way, I know City have won loads of trophies recently, but what it meant for them to win a treble as an example. But West Ham were key. Look what it meant to them. Anyone that thinks top four qualification or goals, anyone that thinks just goals matter. Do you know what I mean? If you went and asked Antonio now, would you want 100, 200 more goals in your career or that medal? He's picking that medal. I can guarantee you the only people that ever defend the lack of winning medals are Spurs fans and people arguing for Gerard in the Skulls Gerard debate. They're the only two sets of people ever that make that argument in football. So, yeah, for me, uh, I, I agree with you guys on that. We have a few super chats and imagine Levy still holding Kane hostage is what Emmanuel Drip says. That's true. Uh, Chris says, uh, Hain, uh, sorry, Hain, Kane will regret his career. I don't want Havertz. <laughs> and, we'll get, and we'll get onto Havertz <laughs> a little bit later. Uh, Harold here says, I just want the debt cleared and competent running of the club. We don't need extra money if well run. He, he, Kane has earned the right to choose. Yeah, I don't think he's choosing, though, but we'll see what happens and see what he does, my friend. Uh, huge news. This year says collect uh, the Glazers collectively now favor uh, Qatari over Sir Jim Ratcliffe. It's game over as he's um, um, as his minority stake strategy doesn't give them an advantage. Sky have tried to debunk this against Reuters, and I'm telling you all now, I'm trusting Reuters <laughs> over Sky Sports News on a business matter every single day of the week. Uh, King Cantona says it's simple. The Glazers are seeing the NBA franchise being sold for double the valuation. There's some, um, they are something similar. Not saying that's right, but that's in their mindset. Well, there is always the possibility that the Premier League continues to grow in valuation. Therefore, clubs do. Um, but at the same time, you know, sometimes you just got, remember they paid not a. Z the Glazers have spent no money buying the club, so for them, every billion is an extra billion that they're gonna they're gonna own. Uh, not trying to hear media spin by Sir. Okay, we'll come back to this one a little bit later about the Havart deal when it makes more sense. Uh, worry about our targets, especially in midfield. Uh, none seem drastically to improve the technical level of the squad and what's happened with the outgoings. I, th I assume you're talking about Man United. We'll get on to one Caicedo uh, in a few moments that Manchester United are linked with. And outgoings seems to be where they were already. It's going to take a few deals to kickstart this transfer window, but great super chat. I wanted to ask, Lewis, I want to ask you this question. Is it a respectful bid from Tottenham to bid £50 million for both Harvey Barnes and Madison collectively? Or is that taking the proverbial? See, if it was a bit more, I would have understood it being like an opening bid to start negotiations. But 50 mil for the pair of them, that's, that's hella disrespectful. You're trying to say both of them are valued at like 25 million each. Or even James Madison, who's like 50 million at a bare minimum. You're trying to say Harvey Barnes isn't worth a penny. Regardless, someone's going to be disrespected, be it Leicester, Madison, Barnes, probably all three of them. But yeah, it's, it's massively disrespectful. I don't know if they'll get the deal through. I think if Madison has any other big six clubs interested in it, will probably prefer them because Tottenham look like a mess right now, but they didn't help themselves. I think when buy you get one, get one free in, Big Mac Tuesday, this is buy one, get one free Big Mac. They, they really <laughs> think that they can get one <laughs> like this. It's, it's yeah, literally it's a McDonald's deal, bro. It's like buy one, get one free. All I have to say is imagine if Manchester United or Arsenal tried to pull this off. We would be spoken about for years about how a meme. A, a meme would be made about this. Yeah, it's like it's they're lucky they're Tottenham. They get away with these kind of dumb moves. But I think about this, we goes back to Levy, innit? Levy, we know he's not. He's trying to eke every penny out of the uh, the buying club from him, and then say he would pinch on the pennies when he when he's purchasing from someone else. But I think they know that Leicester are in a very precarious position. They've obviously been um, relegated. Their finances are very very poor. So I, I would suggest it's probably an opening bid because Leicester's not going to accept that. But when you go in that low already, you're kind of letting them know, listen, we ain't, don't don't even try and fleece us. We're not here for your games. We know the situation you're in. I think the only way Leicester can hold off from probably getting robbed, which is, I think, in the end, is probably what's going to happen, is if other teams come in. So if a Newcastle come in and say we want James Madison for 50, then of course they're not going to sell both Hat Madison and Barnes to um, Spurs for 50 million. But if Spurs are the only bidders for those two, then 
in the end, Leicester's going to have to cave because they cannot keep those two in the championship. It's impossible. The thing is, it's just the same old shit. They've got a new manager in now as well. Like, surely you'd want to go in with an offer which, realistically, like you said, Neeks, first offer might not get accepted. But this is this is taking the piss, right? This is beyond disrespectful, saying that each player's 25 million. For me, if I'm Leicester, I'm looking to, to go sell them elsewhere because Harvey Barnes, West Ham won him. Um, and Madison's wanted by Newcastle. I think, I'm not sure if we won him, but I think he's one of the players on our list, potentially. There's going to be other other clubs coming in that will pay the 50 million for Madison, pay the 40 million. So it's not even a first offer. I would say this is just beyond disrespectful to offer 50 million for both these players. I, I just, I don't get the thinking behind it. Considering they've just got this new manager in, surely you'd want to start on a good good note with him. Do you know what I mean? So but you, but he keeps apologising, like, you know, he keeps apologising with these open letters, yours sincerely, Daniel and all of these things and he's keep, he keeps doing the same thing. Like, it's it's beyond a joke, I suppose. But even look, even look, at, look at Kulisewski because that deal is, that has been done from the moment that they got him alone, there was an agreed fee. I think it's about 35 million but Spurs don't want to pay it so they've gone back to Juve to basically negotiate like Levy is, oh, he's he's, he's something else, he's man. He, he, he is, and but this is the thing. It's as you said earlier, Nick. He he, he charges. He wants you to pay top dollar for his players, and he wants to under pay for everybody else. And I kind of get the notion behind it. Hmm. But what's going to end up happening again to Tottenham is they're going to have a substandard summer. And I think the fans have learned after last year, maybe the last three, four, five years, stop bigging up their summers. Yeah, you know, they've got a manager who is very inexperienced at this level of the game. He's never managed at this level before. He's easily the third, fourth, fifth choice, maybe even beyond that. They need a good start to their summer transfer window and they make a disrespectful bid like this. And I'll, I'll, I'll add this. Look, I know Tottenham are in London. I know they've got a beautiful stadium and some people are attracted to being in London and the stadium and everything else. But Newcastle's an amazing city. They're in the Champions League. The club's heading in the right direction. They have a better manager. I cannot understand for the life of me why James Madison would pick Tottenham over Newcastle. It, over the next 10 years, what Newcastle were going to go on to achieve compared to Spurs. Spurs won't win a trophy in the next decade, where Newcastle are more likely to. They're going to play Champions League football, and they're trying to develop a team that's going to play in the Champions League on a regular basis, but not just be in it. They're going to try and win it. You know, they're already talking about the likes of Barella as an example. Now, they may not get that done this year, but that's the ambition of that football club. Spurs can't do that. They can't do it at all. So... Look, I, I'm not even did, trying to be horrible towards Tottenham. I'm just speaking facts here. It's a horrible move for, for, for Madison. Harvey Barnes, maybe not. But £50 million for the two of them? Get out of here. Not in 2023. Not when Gibbs White is being sold for £40 plus million. You can't do that. Terry, Tottenham are at a crossroad. They, they need to decide what they want to be. At this point, if they, if they don't act, get their act together quickly, they might be stuck as a mid-table club very soon. And that's not even a joke. That's because the, they were before 2009. I know, but, right? but they, they got themselves in a situation where they got up and competing for top four consistently, even got close to a title race twice, but they but they never got over the line. Now they've fallen back down so much that it's going to take them a lot to get back up again. And it's a lot easier to drop than it is for them to get back up, in my opinion. I don't see them going back up, to be honest. I, I don't see, I just, especially if the Qataris buy Man United, I think even the benchmark will be raised. And I don't think they have any thoughtful processes to actually uh, improve their club. I think, yeah, the stadium is beautiful and everything is great in the, the infrastructure, but I don't think the ambition is there to actually win and compete with these guys. So they're just going to go back to be in the Everton Cup, sixth, seventh place, that's it. That's what's going to be it's, it. It's, to be it's, business, it's business first, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Business before football. And when you've got owners like Man City, like Newcastle, hopefully like Man United, which can afford to put the football before the business as their priority, then you're always going to struggle. Especially like Spurs are, yes, they're a big club when you compare to all the clubs that exist in the world. But at the elite level, they're not a big club. So how are you attracting the players that you need to get back to the top if you if you don't have a you know a bottomless pit where you can put football before business at or every juncture? They don't have that. They don't have a pull based on their name like Arsenal do. They don't have a pull based on their their success like Chelsea do. So what is it that's going to attract players to, to Spurs? You say money, but they haven't got. But they don't pay, guys. Their wages as well quite low. 
quite long. Yeah, that's, they don't play it. The thing about the thing about Spurs is that they've got so many, so many parts about their club as a whole, which you can actually build something off of. You know, the, the fact that they're in London. You know, the fact that they've got this this big stadium. There's so many things you can do with Spurs. If the Qataris came into Spurs, for example, they would they would flip that team. They would make that into the the brand new thing. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot that you can you can pump into that club and actually make it into something. But until Levy goes, it's gonna be the same thing. This guy's gonna take one step forward, about 16 st- steps back. It's not five steps back. It's about 16, 17 steps back. Do you know what I mean? He says one thing, but his actions show something else. So listen, let it carry on because I don't like Spurs. But again, with Levy as a as a football fan, it's 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 a bit mad how he is as an owner. To be to be so, fair, someone someone in the comment section just said uh, Dan, Daniel Levy's like Mr. Krabs off of. Uh... SpongeBob. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. He's Julius, definitely. man. He's Julius from um, My Wife and Kids. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that to one point that I was talking. No, everybody hates Chris. Sorry, everybody hates yeah, Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking earlier about this difference between people are talking about the Arabs and the money and all this stuff, and I was saying a businessman is different than an actual someone who cares about the football, like the Arabs or like Roman. What they're willing to take a little bit of a hit. If it means their club will win, it means that the fans are happy. While well, the businessmen, Americans or non-American, doesn't matter for me. They care about revenue minus the uh, expenses that equals this amount of money. But the Arabs, and because I'm a, I'm an Arab and I know how these people love football. Yes, they run the club well, but also they care about winning. They literally care about football. They care about the fans being happy. They want to win for themselves. Like in Emirates, they're celebrating that the people of Emirates are celebrating that their sheikh won a triple for them. Everybody wants that for their club. Roman, Ibrahim, Roman Abramovich wanted to win for himself. He liked the club and he wanted to win. That is so different from the people that run Liverpool, Arsenal and Spurs. And that's why people don't understand. It's not only about the money coming to the Premier League from the Arabs. It's about passion. Passion that's, from these Arab people. A hundred and ten percent. And I'll tell you this now about Spurs. Spurs are basically, all they've now got is a Westfields with a football pitch. That's it. <laughs> They're Westfields with a football pitch. They're a commercial venture. And do you know what I get sick and tired of hearing? Well, we can't compete with the billions of the Arab nations. You can, though. They can't pump all that money in. They're limited to £100 million every three years of personal investment. All the billionaire owners of football clubs can pump money in. The, the Cronkies are richer than Roman Abramovich was, but Roman Abramovich invested more money. He invested £1.4 billion of his own money into the football club. All of our owners can do this if they choose to. We've got to stop defending their lack of ambition as we can't compete with nation states. Yes, you can. You can. You absolutely can. Like these, these are multi-billionaires. These are not me and people like me and you. Do you know what I'm saying? They're multi-billionaires, 100 million pound maximum. They've all got billionaire friends. They can get their friends to sponsor the grounds. Spot friends business. Listen, the Cronkies, I always said about Arsenal, the Cronky family are ma- married into Walmart. Do you know how valuable Walmart is? Just get Walmart. Walmart could pay a lot more money than the Emirates to rename the stadium. Easily. Do a hundred million pound a year stadium deal. Pump all that money into the... That can be done. It can be done. They just choose not to do it. Why? Because it's actually not feasible to pay that much money. It actually isn't a good return of investment. And that's what it's all about for them is what's the, the ROI where certain owners, Roman was like it as an example... Uh, Sheikh Mansour is like, it. it's not about how much money do we make out of sponsoring the club and growing the club. It's how successful can we make it? And that that is the, the, the and, 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 that, and that's exactly I know we haven't seen much because we've had a mess of a season. Right. But that's exactly why Todd Bowley got the club because of his ambition and wanting to win. Um, if you've seen what he's done with the L.A. Dodgers, this is a winner. And if you've done a lot of if you if you actually do. Gal, if you watch a lot of if you watch a lot of um interviews with Todd Bowley before he even t- he even took Chelsea, he's all about winning. He's got a lot of ambition. I know he spent a lot of money. He's about to rob you of got, sixty million, bro. I wouldn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, listen, Egal, Egal, where, Egal, where he went wrong? Nah, the like, moment Egal. you lost me is when you tried to compare Roman Ibramovich to Todd Bowley. Nah, no, 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 no. You're you're missing the point, bro. I said the reason why Todd Bowley got picked as the owner is because of the ambition and wanting to win, not just wanting to come in and make a profit on on you know X amount of players or you know, sponsors or whatever. The Glazers don't care who they're going to sell to. It don't it don't matter to them. They just want the most money. But Roman actually cared about who the club was going to get sold to. That's one thing that I'll say. So I do agree with Mo. That's a really good point you make. Like, ambition is a really good, like, big thing. So you big really think Tom likes the club? It's not, it's not only about the w- winning mean money, but 
I'm telling you, the Arabs and Roman, they were like, they loved their clubs. They, it's, it's like their thing. They made a connection. Oh, the oh, have, have, just, have you seen as well, well, I want to say as well, by the way, back in the day when it used to be local millionaires that owned their club, they again weren't looking for profit. They just, at the inter. They're just not rich enough in 2023 to own these football clubs. They don't have the connections to bring the sponsorships in. But yeah, there's a super chat here that says Spurs uh, are not even uh, in Villa Ever, uh, Everton or Horace level is what Sean Bay says here. That's a Maybe. fact. Well, yeah, we did that la last week. We did the show and the, they weren't even in the top six. The voting, were, they weren't there. Uh, this it's... is uh, even uh, their fans' uh, base are deluded. One Spurs fan channel mocked Inter for reaching the final. What a joke. He has the audacity to talk about Inter. I mean, Spurs are actually, someone just sent me a link, uh, Rod Rodrigo uh, Roadman got a name sent me a link uh, matt law has said spurs have denied they've bid this of course spurs are going to deny they've done this like spurs fans again i already know spurs fans back in the last season were like we're not buying into the pr anymore we're, we've got a fight they're suddenly straight on the pr i've got to defend my club no you guys actually Someone said it. it in the comments terry he's he's mr burns he's actually mr burns when i think about it more, more <laughs> <he's Mr. Burns. laughs> uh how could you consider spurs a big club they're not in comparison to all the rest of us a uh, bowley is so good, he and fans are begging for money. Um, they're, they're begging for money. Bowley's an ambitious man, he just, he, just, he just has no football brain. That's what it is. Probably selling to buy is completely different to begging for money, but go on. This, Save for donation. I want to I I I say this. Uh, it's, it's, it's a guy, we're, we're going to talk rice later, so this we'll try not to segue into it. But Kai Havertz. Kai Kai Havertz. It's now reported he's agreed personal terms with Arsenal. You're looking between 50 and 60 million pounds is going to be the proposed price. I want to go to Egal first on this because I know I've seen you ride this guy, ruin him. It looks like you're about to make him one of the biggest signings in Arsenal Football Club's history. Talk to me, bro. TTP, trust the process. Trust the process, bro. Listen, I don't know how to feel. That's the honest truth. When it comes to my initial thoughts, immediately, when you first hear it, you say to yourself, Kai Havertz, what? Nah, this is a joke. This is just this is just Chelsea trying to, uh, someone, his agent trying to get him a move, right? This, is not, this can't be true. But then, you know what? It escalates and it's like, I don't even know what to say. Maha, just wait for one second. Uh, it, it escalates and then it's like, I'm starting to think to myself, what do they see in him? Because I don't see him as a striker. I don't see him as a number 10. I don't see him as a winger. And I don't really see him as a midfielder either. So I don't know what Mikel Arteta sees in him. But he's been able to do this before, where he's gotten guys that I wasn't really interested in signing, and he made the best out of them. So I have, I have to somewhat give him credit in the bank and say maybe if he signs him, he might become good. But what is the logical point of giving them $60 million so then they can go and get Caicedo, who, in my opinion, was somebody who I really wanted coming into this window. It just, it just, it just leaves me scratching my head, confused in why we're doing this. And as long as, long as Mikel Arteta wants the player, I back him. But personally, I don't understand the transfer. Kai Havertz is garbage. Uh, listen, I don't care. He might, he might go to Arsenal and he banged 20 goals and everyone's like, oh, Nick said he was garbage. I said he was guard. I've been saying he's guard for the last two years. I'm not going to change now because Arteta has great talent ID. He has to prove me wrong. And he was good at Bayer Leverkusen. And since he's been at Chelsea, he's been awful. Now, we might put it down to the management. We might put it down to just everything that's gone at the club, etc. But I can only judge you based on what you're doing. He's been there for, is it two years now? Three? Three years. Three First years. Yep. Three and years. He's exactly. actually got progressively worse. As, as each season's gone by, his first no, season. That's what season. Chelsea do to everybody, bro. No, 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 hold on, hold on, Nick. No, finish what you're saying. We'll go into it. Finish what you're saying. We'll go into it. I'm saying. So for me, yes, there's managers, there's there's, there's owners, there's just everything going to the fan base and maybe toxic. This, or that. but you as a player has have a job to do, and for one reason or another, he hasn't been able to find his position. He hasn't been able to find his form. He hasn't been able to find any kind of fluency, uh, whether it be at Chelsea, in the Premier League in general. And he's just been a bad, bad signing. It may work out elsewhere. 
but I can only judge on what, what I've seen, and he's, so, he's awful. So, so there are two aspects here. Before we, we move on, there is the price and there is the player. I am maybe maybe he sees the same as Odegaard. Odegaard at Real Madrid maybe wasn't great, but then look at Odegaard this year. Maybe he's just Odegaard looking has, at the Bayern Leverkusen. That was better than anything we've seen from Kai Havertz. How many starts? Yes, Odegaard. I agree with you. I agree with you. However, and maybe he, he saw what he had at Bayern Leverkusen. Remember, Kai Havertz is still twenty-four, so he has a resale value. If it's a success at Arsenal, there's a resale value there. But the price, I don't understand how Arsenal can go to Chelsea, who. Purchased this guy for 68 million pounds and offered him 60 after three seasons of failure after failure. You have to at least half that price. You paid 68 for a 21 years old. Now he's three years older and you want 60 million. That's what I don't understand. The player himself, maybe what Egal said about he uh, talent ID from Arteta. He did it before when everybody said that Odegaard is not good enough. And look at Odegaard this year. So maybe he sees the same. But 60 million, I think Arsenal is stupid. They're absolutely idiots. Don't ask questions, bro. bro 60 million is a robbery. Let's be honest. I was laughing at Real Madrid two weeks ago. I'm not going to change my mind. That's ridiculous. 35 what million is, is fair enough based Andrew, on what he did at Andrew, Liverpool. What are you saying? Because you super chatted into the show last night and you kind of defended it as a, as a good bit of business. I don't know what my missus put in my water tail, to be honest with you. I've had a night to, I've had a night to kind of mull it over. But... No, to be honest with you, right, I did say that if the price was right, then I wouldn't have a massive issue with this signing. And there's, there's a little bit of logic behind it, I suppose. I'm trying to think a little bit out of the box, maybe what Mikel Arteta is looking at, maybe what Mikel Arteta is looking at doing with the team. Now, £60 million and £200,000 a week, no, I don't want it. Yeah, Chelsea, you can keep him, right? But however, if we were saying, say we get Kai Havertz for 45 million, then I'd be, I'd think that's a bit more of a reasonable deal, right? And now I look at our team and I look at, right, okay, everybody's questioning what's Kai Havertz's best position? Where does he fit in at Arsenal? Oh, clearly to me, you know, he can't play number nine. So if we're bringing him in to play number nine, then I just think this transfer is ridiculous completely altogether. So the only real option that I can think of is if you play him in and around the number 10 role and then move Odegaard to an eight. And then you uh, against the smaller teams, because we like to be a team that likes to predominantly have the ball um, and dominate the ball, you can kind of afford to play two attack-minded midfielders and then a six behind them. And then against the bigger teams, it gives you options then because you've got uh, Thomas Party and Declan Rice potentially coming in. You could play two sixes and one eight against the bigger teams. So it shores, it shores the midfield up a little bit. I also looked at it like this as well. If we're talking about 10 or, or eight role or whatever you like, right? That then gives us two players in each position of the pitch that can play that role. So Odegaard, and Havertz playing the 10. Um, or Emil Smith-Rowe and Havertz can play the 10. You've got Fabio Vieira and Odegaard that can play the 8. Uh, Declan Rice and Thomas Partey that can play the 6. So that kind of makes a little bit more sense to me than bringing in Declan Rice and Kai Sado, who are both pre predominantly 6s. So... I, I'm not too sure about this, you know. And then when I hear sixty million pound, but then you can go out and get Caicedo for fifteen million pound more, it just makes this transfer seem more and more ridiculous. So I don't know. I don't know how to feel about this one, but I'm glad to hear that a gal is saying, "Look, I, if Mikel Arteta wants him, I back him." Because I've seen a lot of Arsenal fans on Twitter, and I know Twitter is not really, the, you know, but. I've seen a lot of Arsenal fans on Twitter that big up Mikel Arteta's uh, talent ID and this, that and the other that are absolutely kicking up a stink about this transfer. Back your because manager. It because it doesn't make sense. It reminds me of us needing players in other positions and going and signing Nicolas Pepe at the time. It's a similar kind of thing because it's like we all here can sit here and say Kai Havertz was a quality player in Germany. He came to Chelsea and he hasn't lived up to the hype at all, right? But is it going to be a situation where 
where when we sign him, he's just going to magically become that player that he was back in Germany? Or is it a situation that we're going to magically find a position for him? Like, I rate Arteta, but to a certain degree, you're looking at a deal and you're saying to yourself, what's going on? <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry, bless. Brandon. I think the chat <laughs> made me... I don't know if we're talking about Brandon or... Could Kevin. be even so be, you know, I saw a picture of you, uh, uh, Lewis, the other day. You're looking pretty hench, brother, at the minute. Looking pretty hench. Thank you, bro. Thank um, you. Chelsea will do that to you. Yeah, well, I, get that. I want to ask a question to the Chelsea boys. You first. Lewis. How happy are you that you might be getting anywhere between 50 to 70 million pounds for Kai Havertz? Would you take 45? I, I would take 30. So I, I'm ecstatic. I'll I'm so happy. I, I, didn't, I didn't think we'd see this day for years. And now he's going to my rivals as well. All, all the idiots who have overhyped and overprotected this guy for years. And he's decided to rattle all of them out to the rivals. This is why you don't back a player over the club. Guy's not good enough in any position. I understand the debate about him potentially being used as depth. I personally think his only best attribute would be off the bench. That's the only consistent thing I've really seen off him. He is good for the last 15, 20 minutes of a game. But as an eight, he's got no physicality, no defensive awareness. He can barely create from deep with no consistency. As a 10, he can't create consistently and can't do well in tight spaces. As a winger, he can't beat a man consistently. His crossing ain't consistent at all. Up front, oh, no hold up play. There? That's another reason why we can't it. finish, can't head consistently. Guy's one of the worst players I've ever seen play for Chelsea. I've ever seen, because I know there's going to be worse. He's one of the worst I've ever seen play for Chelsea. And if we're going to rob Arsenal of 60 million, don't ask questions, accept the fee, get rid and end this end of an error that's been Kai Havertz. Okay, I need to ask a quick question before we go to the next Chelsea fan. These are the positives that Arsenal fans are speaking about when we speak about Kai Havertz. His height brings us a different element because he might be able to head the ball. Is that a positive? <laughs> He's one of the worst headers that we've got in our squad. No, it's one of his better attributes, but he has no consistency in it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even call it one of his. I wouldn't even call it that, Lewis. I've seen this guy miss so many headers, man, and scoff so many of them. So no, many. Just most of his goals are headers. Is he? Is only he? Way would you say? Would you say with good? Would you say with good wingers next to him, he'd be able to find them, and he's, he has good vision. If he's in tons of space, maybe, and it's still a debate. It's still a very big debate. Also, okay. you need to make sure he has skittles and sweets before games, otherwise, <laughs> he's going to be terrible in the first half. And he only really turns up around March, so. Yeah, can, I add, can I add another thing to this debate, right? How much of Kai Havertz's poor form would you boys put down to the fact that he's had multiple managers at Chelsea? One of them being Frank Lampard twice, then Thomas Tuchel and then Graham Potter, where it didn't really work for Chelsea at all. So is there a player there that Mikel Arteta could potentially work with and get something out of? Or is it just he's just... He's just a, you know, on on, no, on, no, on this no. question, what it is, I, I get I get a lot of strikers haven't been great at Chelsea over the past like few seasons. Since Costa, I would say we haven't had a successful striker. Tammy was good, to be fair, when we had that transfer ban. He put up quite a lot of mm. goals. But other than that, we haven't had that many strikers, right? But with Havertz, this thing about oh, it's just Chelsea, it never it never works there for strikers is overstated. Because if you actually watch him like me and Lewis do week in, week out, this guy has consistently been played by every single manager. That has, that has coached this guy in, in various positions. So he's mainly been played straight down the middle. He's been played as a nine. He was underwhelming there. He's been played behind Lukaku. He's been underwhelming there. He's been played on the wing. He's been underwhelming there. So th the strongest thing I would say with Havertz is he can find a pass. But again, he needs to be in acres of space. When the players come into him, he's not a Felix where he can nip out of it in tight spaces. He's not that, right? Havertz on the ball is not that. And he, look, he looks tall. He's quite tall, but... He's quite slow. When he runs and he's chasing the ball, when he hasn't got the ball, it's like he's got a magnet on his back. Do you know what I mean? It's like something's holding him back. He so plays like he's high, rugged. bro. Yeah, he 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 is not he is not a left at centre mid. Every single Arsenal fan is trying to make sense of it and saying, oh, he's going to come in for and play in Xhaka's role. He is someone that you bring off the bench when there's tired legs, there's a bit more space. He is someone that is just not... I, I just Would don't you say see how it's going to work at Arsenal. No, 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 no,
Trust me. Nice. I, 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 I wanted to touch on this as well quickly because a lot also. of people try to say Havertz was misprofiled and he was let down by um the Chelsea by the whole Chelsea regime and all the managers and everything. First off, Kai Havertz was signed as a versatile player who could play in multiple positions and play in multiple positions well. Kai Havertz himself has come out and said in numerous interviews that he can play as a nine, he can play as a ten, he can play anywhere in the front three. So I, I hate this the, the narrative. I'm not saying it's coming from you, but it's just in mm. general. I hate the narrative in general that like Kai Havertz has been let down by people. Right? He has let himself down. Exactly. Like He was Graham Potter's pet project. Tuchel gave him so much game time up mm -hmm. front, and the whole narrative was, oh, we play so much better as a team with Havertz than Lukaku. We are so much more fluid with him. Yet when we do that, he misses all of his opportunities. The team just play better with him because he's more selfless. The I problem with Kai Havertz is simply himself. That's why he turns up in big games like a Champions League final, like Dortmund at home when we're 2-0 down and we need to turn it around. That's when he turns up. He ain't motivated for anything else. He is barely a jack of all trades. He's a master of absolutely nothing. All he is going to be good for you is a little bit of depth. But he has yeah, been given yeah. fair opportunities here. And the fact that some Arsenal fans are just trying to act like the last three years didn't happen. I'm seeing people put Leverkusen comps up on the timeline. Like, what, what are we doing? <laughs> Do you Did know what COVID is, just is? freeze the timeline or something? I, I, no. I this guy's been Why is Liv's catching years. straight? We've been slandering him for three years, and now some fans want to try and turn it around and act like mm. it's a good thing. Like Another I thing don't like, understand this. Nobody can understand this. So Another what about Sancho? Well. Isn't the same now. thing, guys? I'm sorry. Wait, Sancho whoa, whoa, isn't before, the same whoa, thing. Before, before you come in talking about Sancho, right? Just on Havertz, right? One thing I'll say as well that I'm hearing from Arsenal fans is always oh, confidence. You know, he hasn't got confidence. I'm sorry. Lampard brought him in, was starting him week in, week out. Tuchel came in, was starting him week in, week out. German link up. Potter starting him week in, week out. We had a Bamiyang on the bench and Havertz was still starting ahead of him week in, week out. It's not a confidence thing. It's a quality thing with Havertz. I was patient with this guy, right? I gave him a season. I said, cool, first season, it is where it is. Second season, I still said, you know what? Let's see next season. It's only this season that just went where I said, you know what? It's, it's, it's time for us to move on. I'm happy to keep him in the squad because off the bench, mm -hmm. again, tired legs in space, he's a bit of a drifter. He can do something for you. But week in, week out in this league, it, he, he's not that. Havertz is not that. And it's not just a Chelsea thing because, yes, we have played him in multiple positions. But like Lewis said, the, the guy said it himself. He's he mainly been driver. up front too. And there's yeah. been no development in any trait of his ability Nothing. in the last three seasons. He, yeah. I don't he, he doesn't know how to put his foot through the ball. His finishing is terrible. He creates a few chances here and there, but his big chances that he misses week after week. When he when he kicks it, when he when he tries to shoot, it's like a, a pass back. He's got this little lob trait he does. I don't know what it is, this little lob thing. So I don't understand where he's gonna play in this team because he's worse than Jesus. Jesus is 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 a terrible finisher. Let's be let's be honest. He's not the greatest finisher. Havertz is worse than that. So where are you gonna play? Kai Havertz. I do not understand. The, the Jacker role, apparently. The Jacker role. Was, That's what they're saying. I'm That's looking, I'm looking, saying. I'm looking at the last it. three years. I'm looking at your last three years. There is not even one frontline player that came to your club and performed well. From Pulisic to Ziyech, Timo Werner, Havertz, Aubameyang. Tell me one. So Havertz maybe it's not only... Game time than all of them, though. All of them. Hey, so here's my, uh, my problem. Maybe he's the best of all of them. That's why every coach... Is playing him. Why do you think all these coaches are playing him? They have to see something in him that you guys don't see. I'm not defending okay, the performances. Then I'll add one other thing. Let me just say, I am right not position. defending the performances. I'm not defending the performances. However, if every single coach is coming in and playing this guy over the other guys, maybe he's the best. Maybe they see something in him. And the problem is they can't get the, the best the out of him. The least that. The least that. That. It's, it's what the off the ball movement yeah. brings, though. The movement, like, that's one of the things that he's decent at. He gets into right positions and the team play more fluid as a result. But his application on the ball is not there. That's why I always ask people on numerous streams, and I never get an answer because there isn't an answer, what on the ball attributes does Kai Havertz bring consistently to any football team? There is none. He doesn't bring anything no, consistently. Yeah, but you, you have to question it as well, though, right? Because Real Madrid were interested in him. Bayern Munich are apparently interested as well, although they haven't made a move. So these big clubs are coming in for him, so he can't be as bad of a player as what we are seeing at Chelsea. City also as well. City have been... I swear it was Ornstein yesterday when he mentioned Kai Havertz, also mentioned an interest from City. It is intriguing yeah. to see what they see. I want to go to some super chats here on this. First one says, genuine question. 
What about Kai Havertz do you think makes Madrid, Bayern, and now us want him? If he comes, meh, I'll back him, but I don't like this deal. And Ibi, that's the question that was just... And I've been asking that about Mason Mount as well. Mason Mount's got so many top managers. I think this is the only thing, Terry, that everyone's looking at Chelsea as a yard sale and they're saying, who's the most quality? What's the most quality? Who's the player who has the most like potential, talent, potential. Uh, potential in, in him? that we've seen something from in the past. Mm. And everyone's looking at Kai Havertz and they're saying, you know what? He He's raw, but we can get a lot from that. If we, if yeah, we who, Who's everyone? Us. Because it's only you guys in the league. Bro, it's there, Real Madrid there, there are willing to spend 50 million. Bayern, league, I'm asking in the league. Bayern have wanted him for two years. Appar- apparently, apparently, what do you call it? Uh, Man City now. I've never heard this until now. But Terry said, "Man, let, let, let me tell you something about Bayern Munich. They're, they're, they're not they're not going to come back in for 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 Havertz after they've they've just had this season where they literally had to win the league on the last day of their season, and they haven't had a finisher after lo- losing Robert Lewandowski. Right? They're not going to cash out sixty million on Kai Havertz. It is not happening. Right? So the Real problem Madrid, is price, Don. It's not the quality. The problem is price. Now, now you're whoa, talking whoa, whoa, whoa. about the no, price. No, 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 no. no, no. Now you said they're not coming back for sixty, but if you offered oh, him for forty, they would sign him. So they, they could don't see him as Exactly. They, so they no, don't no, no. see him as trash. They just don't value don't him now. Trash. I don't think it's you trash. When, when he was when he was linked to Madrid, he's been trash for us. He's been trash for he's been trash for us. But I don't think I don't think if he, right, for me the best option for him is to leave the league. Lewis goes games week in week out. I went to quite a few games last season as, as well, right? And off the ball, this guy is just is just is, is terrible, man. He, he's just not it, right? But. Again, off in other leagues, Real Madrid, Real Madrid, when they were linked to him, I said he was going to do well there because it's a different league. You get a lot more space, you, different players. It's completely different to the Prem. I don't think he's he's the right type of player for this league, in all honesty. I don't. There we go. I want to do some more of these Super Jets here. This one says, apparently, we need uh, Champions League football to attract world-class players just to end up with uh, that bum Havarts. But Chelsea are going to buy Caicedo, finishing 12th. We don't act like a big club. Edu, out. Uh, won't pay 60 million. Football isn't um, as rigid as it, as it used to be. We shouldn't get caught up uh, on positions. Uh, bigger question is what will his role be in the system and how will he adapt based on the state of the game? And I think we've kind of gone through that quite a bit with with, with Brandon Gunner, uh, O77. Thank you very much for that super chat. It means a great deal to us. Um, this here says, yeah, this, this, back to, yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that one. <laughs> this here says, uh, Kovacic, Havertz, Mount, and Gallagher, 180 million. Yeah, you, you could, oh. you could, you could raise that amount. You never know. You could. We, we will, we will see. That's uh, my owner, bro. If, if that happens, they got fat man. They got fat up. You'll get Todd a lot of DRC. Uh, Alex here says uh, we have to understand there's a massive gap uh, in perceptions in the way pros and fans view players. Havertz has good qualities and could work out under Mikel Arteta. Alex, Alex, put it this way, right? If Havertz was linked to United and they were coming in for him, Arsenal fans, all of them would be getting onto them and saying, look at the player you're getting. It's only now you're trying to make sense of it to back your manager. Look, you can back your manager and, and still disagree with, with signings he wants to bring in. A lot of United mm-hmm. fans don't agree with, with them bringing in Mount. So it, it's, there's backing your manager, but there's also having your, your own perception of a player. So, so this is it. I, I was going to say this because like, similar. I don't know if we're going to talk about Mount in any, any depth, but this is very similar to Mount in the sense of Mount and Havertz. For me, I said it, for me, as I said earlier, I think Havertz is trash. But they are professional footballers who has performed here or there, depending on you know a different maybe a different team or a different season, whatever. So they obviously can do a job, but at sixty million plus, you need a player that can do more than a job. You need more than a squad player. You might come in for a few games when someone's injured. For that kind of money, 60, 70, what Chelsea are asking for, and potentially these clubs are going to pay, you're looking to go straight into the first team and improve your team to a level that it wasn't at previously. And there's a lack of evidence for me, other than the fact that, well, my manager makes good signings. There's a lack of evidence in those players to say they're going to go and do that. If you bought them for 30 million, that's fine. Because Mm -hmm. they can do a 30 million pound player job, I'm not expecting a 30 million pound player to come straight into a starting lineup and then and take us to the next level. But for 60, 70 million, we bought Casemiro and he changed our team. I'm not expecting Mount and Havers to be Casemiro and I'm getting twisted. Or anyone, like this man's a five-time Champions League winner. But that's the kind of price and therefore the expectation I'm I'm expecting. And Havers kind of doesn't money. move the needle. He doesn't move the needle. For, for, for us as Chelsea fans to, to not even what you know blink an eyelid, the fact that he's going to Arsenal, well, it looks like he's going to Arsenal, it just says it all. Can I, can I tell you something? Though? I, 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 I get that. 
I, one I second, one second. I'm not backing the Kai Havertz signing fully. I understand that there's a lot of questions I have about it, and everyone deservedly so. But one thing we can admit, as all of us here, taking a person who's starting week in, week out at Chelsea Football Club and putting him on our bench is massively improving our squad. He's not, he's not, he's not going to be on the bench. Uh, he's not there's no way in hell. There's no way in hell that we... No, there's no way in hell... I don't know who he benches for you guys. We, we don't buy him as a bench player. Why would you pay a player £200,000 a week to sit on the because bench? Because we're trying to catch up with City and nowadays £50 million. Pounds You're trying to catch player. up with City with Havertz. Have... <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. No, 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 wait a second. Listen to what I'm saying. Spending okay. £50 million pounds for bench players is is the benchmark for uh, for what you need to do nowadays. A backup centre-back is going to cost you around 50 to £40 million. But but you need first team midfielders. Yeah, we're gonna still we're still gonna get Declan Rice. I hear you guys That's, on that. Just, just in terms of the interest of time here, this one says Egal Kai Havertz. Sorry, Kai Havertz, uh, Neeks, uh, Kai Havertz versus what's that? Sancho. Sancho. Sancho Anthony. I, oh yeah, San, oh, okay. Anthony. Sancho and Anthony stats. I rest my. I've never heard someone put those two words together before. It threw my dyslexia That's right smart. off. Um, yeah, Mo, Anthony was on the prize, by the way. So. Anthony uh, Oda, uh, sorry, Martin Odegaard was top, uh, was uh, team, team of the season yeah. and won yeah. uh, player of the month in Ho in Holland and Spain before the Premier League. Kai had one good season before coming to the Premier League. Besides that, he is a, a very talented player. Thank you. I haven't missed your super chat. I just didn't bring it up yet because it was about Spurs. It wasn't relevant to the Havertz conversation. I don't like to go off on and deviate because it kind of ruins the flow. I'll come back to that later, my friend. Don't worry, they all get starred. But you put it in after we finished that subject. So I'd moved on. Uh, Chelsea fans uh, live in denial. Facts that their club uh, ruins players. The panel should pray for Nkunku uh, as they ruin another bright talent. We gave Havertz every available opportunity to succeed and he failed at every opportunity. He stinks. There we go. Oh, All I have to say is I hope and pray to God that Victor Ozyman doesn't go to Chelsea. He deserves better. Okay. Yeah, and you lot deserve Havertz. <laughs> so, it, do, it does uh, let me just get through these super chats we can move the subject on a little bit guys this here says uh, can see Spurs owner Joe Lewis's yacht from where I am staying in uh, how is that pronounced Amalfi Amalfi I'm Amalfi. 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 Uh, gonna have a word with him about us signing Kane go for it call him me old mate a strong arm him if you can um, Terry do you want Qatar to take over yes I do uh, every Arsenal ball deserves a bombastic slap I like that. I like that. Uh, not trying to hear the media spin by certain Arsenal fans. As Lewis said on Twitter, you man cooked him for loving him. Allow the German giraffe is what uh, right here. Facts. Says there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot. That's what I think most Arsenal fans are like, oh, damn, there's going to be so many receipts of me cooking this man. I can't be uh, coming out. Um, stay with Chelsea slightly and with Arsenal and United. Um, it's reported now that Chelsea will make a formal bid for Moises Caicedo, but what Simon Phillips has said that in the process of negotiations, Chelsea have kind of upset and annoyed the agents of Caicedo and Brighton. They've added that there was a report earlier today that Arsenal were out of it, but Simon Phillips says sources claim that Arsenal are still in the race and that Man United are serious about trying to buy him. However, Tony Bloom is now coming out and stating they value Caicedo as high as £120 million. Pounds. This is a big transfer to unpack. Firstly, does anybody see Arsenal getting him if they get Declan Rice? No, no, I don't no. see Arsenal paying 120 million, even if they don't get Declan Rice. I don't see anyone paying 120 million. I'm gonna be very, very, mm. very. Um, do you, do you know what that? Do you know oh. what that price tag right there tells me? It tells me that Chelsea are the prime negotiators when it comes to Caicedo because. Brighton would have only really up their price from the you know the quoted 80 85 90 million pound to 120 million knowing full well that you know Chelsea had just gone out and brought a reasonably unproven talent in um what's his what's his name Enzo. from Benfica Enzo Enzo Fernandez. Enzo Enzo Fernandez so that tells me that Chelsea are in prime position for Caicedo and they're just trying to get more money because they know that Chelsea are willing to throw money at problem. Cook Correa. Well, what I think it is, is it could be that, but I also think 
Brighton have had a massive interest in trying to keep Levi Colwell. And I think they've raised that because they kind of want Colwell to be part of the deal. I was going to say, there's, there's, there's talk of Conor there's Gallagher being part of that deal. There's, there's talk of Conor Gallagher being part of that deal, which could oh, yeah, God, make, please. make, make us... Uh, a sub, I, I agree with what um, Brandon said. I think Man United are genuinely interested, but they're just not... There's no point leading the negotiations when that kind of money is being discussed. You've got to wait and see where the final price ends up kind of being. Because there's no way he's worth 100, like 120, even at his best. He's a 70, 80 million pound player, in my opinion, right now. We were reported a few days ago to like only be wanting to match what Arsenal were offering. Yeah, Let me, I'm guessing that might have been from my after they pulled yes, out. This is, this is my logic. Guys, we all seen what happened with the whole uh, Liverpool getting McAllister for 34, 35 mil. That's too cheap. They are now trying to make up that money that they lost on on McAllister with uh, by overpricing Caicedo and trying to get as much money out of the Caicedo deal because they don't want a situation where they sold McAllister for thirty five mil and now they sell uh, uh, what do you call it Caicedo for sixty seventy eight and then they end up having two players that could have got them close to two hundred mil go for go for way less than that so I really do think because they they see a bidding war for Caicedo they're gonna milk it as much as possible. And this transfer, Chelsea are obviously going to be leading the race because Arsenal seem to have withdrawn from it, which is ridiculous in my opinion. But on the other hand, this is where they make their money. This is the only way, uh, this is the only ploy one, one thing, one, to cash in. One thing I'll say, one, one thing okay. I'll say about Casado is he has been our main target for, for a minute now. Um Fabrizio keeps mentioning his name. Um we tried to again, no. we tried to but we tried, we actually bid it for him in January. 55 yes, million. 50 million. Um, and then we moved on to Enzo, right, to get that sorted out. So how I'm looking at it now, it's not good for rivals that we lost out on Agate. Because I think we're going to be really aggressive with, with Casado now. Because, again, he's, he's been our main target. And this is a player that is... When you're talking about moving the needle, Neeks, with Havertz, he doesn't move the needle. Casado moves the needle. He elevates your team, right? Hence why we all want him. So Bro, I do I think, think we're going to be quite fun. aggressive. I don't think we're going to pay... The 120 million. I don't think it's gonna go that that high. To be honest with you, let, um, let me, let me no, ask, I think he's a Chelsea player. Really one second, second guy. Let me ask Don. Mm. If you did pay 120, mm. would that be of any any concern to you, or is it just nah. getting the player at all costs? No, no, no. I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it because no one talks about Enzo's price, the, the amount that we've. I do on, on all the time. Dude, everybody oh, but right. you, Don. Don. Everybody okay. but you, Don. Everybody. Yeah, yeah, but, no, you. but you got listen. If you want the player, nobody. Only Chelsea fans don't. If you want, there's certain players that I'm gonna. I'm. I'm happy to 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 pay what the what the club wants for them because that's how much they value that player. There's certain no, players that I'll do that for. Casado is one of them, right? Let me let me just finish my point, Nigel. Yeah, and yeah. one thing I'll say as well is, we've to be honest with you, we've done a lot of groundwork in Casado, in, in my opinion. We've got Win Stanley, Lawrence Stewart. They were both at Brighton as well. Um, they were there when Casado was at Brighton. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So there's quite a few links between us and Brighton. Obviously, they've finessed us quite a bit. Um, so 120 million. Listen, we're getting 60 million for Havertz. So it is where it is. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm just going to say this. I've given up on Casado. Congratulations, he's going to be a Chelsea player. You're not going to be paying 120 million. You're going to probably pay closer to 80 to 90 million, most likely. Yeah. This is I'll not even an ITK 100. thing. From my prediction, Chelsea not only go and get Caicedo, they're now going to go and get, after they get Caicedo wrapped up, they're going to go get Lavia. You're probably going to key, uh, sell uh, Levi Colwell to him for the, for the difference, maybe 40, 50 million, however much you guys want for Levi Colwell. You end up selling him. So at the end, it will be a situation where like, Instead of you guys give, give, getting him for twenty million, you're gonna also get like forty million for what's his face, uh, Levi Colwell. We're, so, we're not gonna sell Colwell. We're, we're not gonna sell him. I think I'll, you probably I'll, I'll, will. We're, we're not gonna sell him. I'll Can I just say? Do you see? Do you think he plays for you guys? One hundred percent, he plays. One hundred percent, he plays. It's between him I'm and Buddy Shaw, and as as we speak, Buddy Shaw is injured as well, so he might not even be fit for the start of the season. We don't know. But I'm Levi Colwell is definitely in the plans. From a Chelsea yeah. perspective, though, are you, are you guys not worried about majorly overpaying for Kai Sado? Like, 120 million is majorly overpaying for Kai Sado. And the reason why I say this is you're risking becoming now a club that is willing to overpay for every player that they get. So, therefore, when you uh, eventually go into a market and you want a, another player, you're instantly going to get quoted well above, you know, the original price that they would want. So, you... Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, you, I get, I get, I get, I get that, Brandon. But 
with the 120, I honestly don't think it's going to go that high. I think what Brighton are doing is quite similar to what we're doing with our our key players, where we're outpricing them, yeah, but, looking, but you know, to, to yes. sort of meet in the middle. That's what I but think this, the main but this thing is. is. Exactly, this is exactly it. If, if, if Brighton are sitting there and watching Chelsea turn around to and, and try and get 80-odd million, right, for uh, Mount with one year left on his contract who doesn't want to sign a new deal who they clearly don't rate. Chelsea have made a statement they don't rate him as an £80 million player by not offering him the salaries that other players of that level have been given at their football club. So when they're inc inflating those prices, anyone Chelsea are trying to buy is they're going to do exactly the same thing. I still think it'll end up coming in around the £80 million mark in the end. But this yep. is what happens. And Chelsea here are, have got a slight problem though. And Chelsea's problem is Preseason starts in three, three and a half weeks. When's your first preseason game, uh, boys? Do you know the date of it? Um, July is somewhere here in America, beginning of July. Oh, yeah, Man, Man United is something like the 13th or 14th of July. So yeah, clearly, 12th, here in America, 12th of July or something like that. Oh, for July. Just... You normally train for at least a week before you have your first game. So you're talking so, three I'm weeks sure. to preseason. Your manager can't be taking four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten players on preseason tour. That he doesn't want any 19th sport. of July. Is our there, we, okay. there we go. So you're going to start training in three weeks' time for that, right? So you've got to get some of these players out. You've got to get some of these new bodies in to give Poch any real chance of developing a style of play before this season begins. Now, I know you don't have European football, so there's a bit more time to train in the middle of the week. But at the same time, like Chelsea have got to be a little bit careful here that you don't. I actually think you should take, maybe not take a hit, but you should sell Mount and the Havertz of this world for a sensible price. 40s, 45 million, maybe 50 million for them. Get them out. Get your players in that you're leading the race for now because the, the last thing you need is for this takeover of Man United to happen and our owners to come in and go, boom, there's 85, 90 million, get it done and just walk away with the player. So Chelsea have to be very, they're playing a game and it's a sense, it's a smart game. But you've got to know when to get out of the water. And we're going to get exactly. on to getting out of the water. You've just got to be very, very smart. Um, and I know someone here says, Terry, Matt Lauren from British has said we're the front runners. I'm not denying that. There's nothing in my statement, DJ, that goes against that. But that isn't the point. You can be the front runners. But you've all heard the story of the hare and the tortoise. You know, that's that, 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 that is, I don't know how many years, how many centuries old that story is, but it rings true. You have to get your business done. You can't. Sort of, you can't sit around and, and act like no one else might may, may, may step in at any mm. single point. You have to be very, very mindful. Always, of that. always take front runner that front runner comment with a with a pinch of salt because anything mm. can happen. Anything. Just can to add to that, though, Tell. Just to add to that, though, Tell. Arsenal got to be careful as well because if the rumours are true and we are still interested in Caicedo, if something happens with this Declan Rice deal, and we then have to go in and try and get Caicedo as our backup, we then have to uh, kind of be careful about Chelsea getting this deal over the line, Manchester United potentially coming in. So, I don't know. I think it's more than Chelsea that have got to be careful. No, no, I I, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, Lewis, have you got a shoot? Have you got a shoot now? I know you have to say you have to go. About two minutes, two minutes. Okay, cool. Because Staffy is going to come in. I just want to make sure that you weren't sitting Oh, yeah, there. cool. But I'll just do now then. No, no. Big no, up. All right, bro. bro. Cheers, mate. See, See you later, mate. Thank you. Oh, sorry. He was saying something as I removed him. Sorry, I hate when I do he that. Said, might as well. He said, might as well. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Staffy's here with us now. I hope you're good, bro. Yeah, they just need to be. They just need to be mindful with it. Um, th there's no doubt about it whatsoever. But wow, such a good player, so needed. I hope Man United come in. I, I hope we come in and take this. In the last week, there's low, just loads of little United are interested. They want to be kept informed. Simon Phillips is someone I really trust in the Chelsea fan base, yep. and on his Substack today, basically spoke about. Chelsea maybe have annoyed a few people, but he says that Man United are serious. So whether that's serious after we get Mount, maybe it's serious once we know about the takeover. Hopefully the deal isn't done by then. Plus, you know, players are all on international duty at the moment as well, which slows things down. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, well, one, thing, one, thing, one thing I'll say, Terry, the other day it came out that um, Poch is trying to take a, a calm approach. Um because last season, there was a lot of leaks. Literally every single player we wanted was out there because Todd Bowley was trying to build relationships, telling journalists everything. It was out there in the open, every single player was after. With Casado, it's been it's been quiet. And I, to be honest, I like the silence, but I'll only be happy with the silence if, like you said, we're flexible with the prices. Because if we just keep banging on, asking for 70 million for Havertz, asking for this for, for Mount, and it's just not realistic, we're going to end up in a position where we're, we're stuck with these players, to be honest mm. with you, or, 
you know, we, we can't get rid of them before the 30th of June. So, yeah, that's that's the predicament that we're in right now. So hopefully we can get that sorted out. I, I, I totally agree. Just in, in terms of, we're just going to move off this subject a little bit because yep, there yep. is some breaking news. Arsenal are readying a new one hundred million pound bid. It's still the public the, the public stance from West Ham is they want more than hundred million, but West Ham are readying a new one hundred million pound bid, ninety million plus add-ons for Declan Rice. As we all know, the first bid was rejected. City are now involved in this. They want the player. Talk to me, Agawa. Hundred million pound. This offer now is ninety plus ten. They believe. For the player, City, the big blue shark is swimming around your feet right now. What's going to happen, do you think? First of all, I'm not too concerned about City at this moment in time because I don't think City have made a bid or anything else. But if they do progress and, and they go on to make a bid and they turn the player's head, then I'll be quite more worried. But at this moment in time, we've done a lot of the groundwork with Declan Rice. We've spoken to his family, his agent, gotten uh, done the preliminary conversations with West Ham. Now we're bidding $100 million. I'm hopeful that this deal will get done. I'm hoping that more or less likely this will be something that's wrapped up by the time the international break's done. I don't know when that is, but once the international break's done, we can maybe see him in an Arsenal kit. But until then, I'm just, I'm just, I just want to get the bid accepted and and then have all the here we goes and everything as soon as possible. Am I getting worried? No. Am I excited? No. I want this wrapped up. We've been doing this since January. Get it sorted so we can go on to the next transfer. For God's sakes, I'm ready to buy a Declan Rice shirt right now. <laughs> just get just get the guy in. Hey, Gal, the last time you weren't worried about City, you drew three games in a row and then lost them in the FBM. I think you need to worry <laughs> No, about that's it. a lie. I was worried about them back then. I oh, just, sure I, just were, last, I, I don't remember the last time I wasn't worried about City. Well, the, the person who I said I wasn't worried about that actually confused me was Chelsea because they ended up putting the money on the table. So I'll say it again. If Man City want to beat us to Declan Rice, it's going to be a situation where they sell a bunch of their first team players and they pro- and, and they, they bring him in as one of their marquee signings. Until Decl- uh, until Gundogan and Bernardo Silva walk out that door and I see Declan Rice coming in, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be worried. I think Declan Rice is still gonna be an Arsenal player come the end of the window. They, they can still they can still bring in Rice without selling Gundo and and Silva because those two think, are gonna have they're to gonna leave. have multiple offers. They're gonna have multiple offers from various clubs, in, including the Prem. So also, what would be ideal factor, for me? What? You have to factor in the London mm. factor. He might want to stay in London also. Yeah, no, the only 100%. thing you should be clutching, the only thing, if Pep Guardiola talks to this player <laughs> and Gundogan, <laughs> I'm sure that Man City are well-organized club that they know at least now 90% Gundogan if he's staying or leaving. And I think he will. He might be leaving, right? And also, Kevin De Bruyne is getting old. If Pep Guardiola picks up the phone, calls this guy and says, listen, you're coming in, you're learning from the best. So, Rodri, you're learning from KDB. You're going to learn from the best. You're going to work with me. We're going to make you a marquee signing for us. He goes there. I'm sorry, Gal. Nothing against Arsenal or anything, but you're only going to be clutching to the London thing. But I think Pep Guardiola and Man City, as of now, after this trouble, man, they, they are a very successful club to the point that I think they have one of the biggest pools in the world now at the moment, especially... With Guardiola, the two years, it's enough for Declan Rice to be a superstar around the world. We Just for two years of Pep Guardiola. Well also, months, one bro. more thing, Phillips might be on the way out. Yes, Phillips I was wants just gonna to say stay, that. but today it came, it, 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 it's reported that they aren't like really strict on keeping him. So they might offer him to West Ham. Take okay. Phillips and we'll Fair take enough. Declan Rice. They can you easily send him the other exactly. way around, Mo. Like I agree saying. with the guy. They understand. need to finish it now. They need to finish Bro, this now. I understand. I understand the player, the player wanting to go to the more ambitious project and everything. I get it, right? Man City is obviously the more ambitious landing spot for him as a player. No question about it. A lot of people would choose City over Arsenal at this moment in time. They just did the goddamn treble. I'm not delusional. But what I'm going to tell you is when it comes to when it comes to a player doing the groundwork with the player, speaking to his agent, getting a lot of the work done, it's, they're going to have to do a lot to bypass us because we've we've we we've, we've built. You've done that with Mudrik. Club and thing. The <laughs> difference with Mudrik was the difference with Mudrik. <laughs> one second, one second. The di- the difference. The difference with Mudrik is we knew what Schalke were doing the whole time they were keeping in contact with you guys. This is the first time I'm hearing West uh, Newcastle, uh, sorry, not Newcastle, Man City are in contact with him this whole window. Gra- Gra- Chelsea, we've right, right, you guys right. in contact Ground, with him. Groundwork okay. means absolutely nothing if you don't get the player, Miguel. Right? We're going to get him. 
Right. Okay. Well, I, I hope I hope for Edu's sake we do because if not, I want his head on a stick. Yeah, because this guy has been negotiating this deal since January, apparently. Right. Yeah. We've we've done the whole respectful thing with West Ham by letting them play their final. Blah blah blah. That first bid that we made was a joke, by the way, because if you know round or roundabouts what West Ham are asking for for the player, why do you go in and lowball like that, right? And I know I understand that in a negotiation you have to start low and then make your way up, right? But we made this mistake with Mudrick. We we made this mistake a second time round, which is allowing uh, Manchester Manchester City to come in and show their interest now. And we need to get this deal done and over the line. So, and apparently as well, I don't know how true this is, but apparently, uh, according to one of the journalists on Sky Sports, the way that we structured that that first bid and the way that we were structuring the deal was a complete joke as well. So what my question is, is we've been speaking to West Ham since January. We've definitely been speaking to them since they played their final. Why are we only bidding nowhere near what they want for the player, knowing full well it's going to get rejected? We're just wasting time here. Like, get, just I, bro, I have a theory. The line, get the player over the line and move on to your next target. I don't understand I this. have a theory. I have a theory. Call me crazy. Terry, you let me know if you think this is true or not. A lot and anyone good, here. Good song, I man. genuinely believe that they give us teardrip old news just to mess with us. Like, because this has probably happened, and we probably spoke to West Ham and gave them this 80 million pound bid months ago. And they're just telling us now Month. because we've actually given them the second bid maybe a couple of weeks ago. And everything is being fed to us now because the window is closer and the transfer season. Is Egal, it was an official Egal, bid, it, Egal. It, Hold it, on. It was an official, it was an official bid, Egal. Official stuff is bullshit. That's what I'm saying. But why would it be bullshit? It, okay, so is the second bid that came in right now official? Is that bullshit? Because no, I'll tell you something, I, bro. I sat here two weeks ago. That's the last time I was on the top six. And I said the same thing about Rice. And everyone in, in the comments was crying. Oh, Staffy's bitter. Staffy hates Arsenal. He has an Arsenal agenda. Look at us two weeks later, and we're still talking about this, and it's not even close. And here's the thing, bro. You want you might want to say that. You just said, like, call me deluded. Yes, I will call you deluded because what you just said right now was insane. There's a difference between negotiating and officially placing a bid. If I want to buy Terry's car and I tell him, Terry, what's the price of your car? And he says, I, Terry, I don't know what your car is. But let's say you said 20 grand. I don't know what it is. It's, you a, say it's, a, it's a new M4 <laughs> competition convertible. He loves talking about his car. I don't know how Five, much that, yeah. that car is, but I'm just going to say a random price. So 20K. And Terry tells me, listen, it's 20K. And I go in officially the next day with money. And I'm like, here you go, Terry. 15K. He's going to be like, are you stupid? I just told you during the negotiations my what my evaluation is. Now, the issue is that you guys are not negotiating. This was an official bitty gal. And when I sat here two weeks ago and I said, Arsenal have history of being incompetent when it comes to big deals like that. And if you separate examples, I got called a hater. Look at us two weeks later. The same thing is still happening. And now we're talking about Man City coming in. And you're still telling me you're not worried. If I'm Arsenal, I would be worried. I would be worried if I'm any club and Man City is coming in for one of my players because they're not just ambitious. They already have an established project. Everyone else doesn't have an established project like them. Anyone who goes into that team knows they're already going into an established team and there's not much transition going on. You're just going to have to go there and be yourself. And that's what's okay, going to happen all, with Declan Rice. He doesn't need to worry about all that stuff. He's going into a team, all, all potentially is, going into a team that has a, just won a treble. So bro, I don't understand how you're not worried. This doesn't make sense, though. 80 million pound bid that's coming in this time. Official bid this, official bid that. I don't think it's official. I think they're all BS. Honestly, I'm not making this up. I genuinely believe that these bids that they keep saying were rejected, this is that, it's literally just like conversations that they're having. It's not official bids. It's literally, they've had these conversations months ago and they're just telling us about it now to create more drama. I don't think these things happening are at the moment. More drama for who? Yeah. For who? Because for just who? a couple, just two weeks ago, we heard about Arsenal have agreed 100 million something. Didn't that come from The Guardian? So how are we agreeing 100 because million? So, so can and I ask you a question? So, if, you're, if your second bid tonight that you're saying is bullshit is accepted, 
is it a real accept or a fake accept? No, Terry. What I'm saying is... <laughs> this has... Hang on, let me finish. Because if that bid was actually done months ago and they're only telling you about it now, why would it be accepted now if you made it two months ago? Because as we no, know, no. as we know, we've seen many transfers be done before season's end. We, we saw Pulisic signed by Chelsea before a season end. Jude Bellingham was done before the season was ended. So I, I, get, I think you're right to a certain degree, but you're going far too tinfoil hat with it. My view, my view, I agree with you. There's no such thing as an official or an unofficial bid. They're all bids, as an in, in my personal view. Maybe there's a different, maybe there's a different process around it. But I do believe yesterday night or this morning, you put in on on official paper or official email. It used to be fax. I bet they email now, saying we are officially bidding eighty plus ten. I believe I trust what Sammy McBell has said. You're now going to bid ninety plus 10 for the player but it's official if we want a, we want a genuine response from you it isn't an inquiry it isn't a would this do would this work what you know what would they think of this so there are differences i don't think i don't think the bid that got announced yesterday was done three months ago i think you're going too far with that and what i would say about city is this you are ahead of city right now but you got to get out of that water mate they are a big blue shark that jaws music is playing and if you stay in there too long if you negotiate too long They'll, they'll bite your legs off. You and I'll just add as well. I think deal just done. Before you go, I just, just want to just before you go. I promise I'll be quick. I just want to say, Terry, you iter reiterated it perfectly. What I meant was these conversations that they're having months ago are now just being publicized because the transfer window is actually happening, and this is where money is being exchanged. Doesn't mean that they haven't already pre-agreed a ninety-two million pound fee plus add-ons that's going to happen in a couple of weeks' time. The same transfer that we heard about two months ago is going to be official in a couple of weeks' time. That's just all that I'm thinking is going to happen. So it's not a coincidence that you hear about a 92 million pound bid plus add-ons two months ago. And then when the final deal details come out, it's like, oh, what we heard about two months ago is actually what we're hearing on paper. So is it a coincidence that a new, a new bid came out the same day of the rejection? Like they just plan to let's post the old one just because they're going to do a new one as well. Do you really think that's what happened? Honestly, I think it's all a circus sometimes. It's a but the fact Can that I... we're actually entertaining Egal's idea, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, with all due respect, Egal. I, Listen, I, I, bro, I, 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 I get it. Egal, what Egal is telling us, that all the news we're reading now is actually two months old, and they're giving us the news today. What are we talking about? Can I, can like, I, can I, you're not serious, Egal, right? You're really the just... I'm dead serious. Really like just saying stuff, right? Right? I'm Message dead serious. Can I, well, well, this is crazy, Egal. You're literally telling us that in March, the actually the bid went for 80 and West Ham rejected it, and they bid 100. But now, because the window is open, they are giving us the news every three days. How, how many months have we been negotiating? I have never seen this before, my friend. I've never Bro, seen we've this before. I've never heard of it. And we've actually, what you're saying is January. absolutely crazy. Like, listen, One second. This is I, I love care. Arsenal fans. Well, I, I don't, I don't care. care. Listen, this is not. my opinion. <laughs> I, love you. I love you, man, but this is it absolutely might be wrong. beyond. It might be crazy. This, Call you won't be on today. I don't care. The reality is we've been negotiating since January. There is potential that some of the stuff that's been negotiated since January will be drip fed to the media to benefit either side later on in the negotiations. Has anybody heard ask, this before? Right. Is this ever happened no. before? Ever? It happens all the time. Nope. People benefit, it benefits them to leak information from previous on, conversations. Egal, 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 Egal. Give me an example. Again, like I've said, I, I do agree with one bit that all bids are proper bids. I don't really like this unofficial, I just don't like the BS. Let me the give you an example. Right. However, Newcastle. give me an example. Newcastle. Give me an example. So uh, let me make the, sure the question's clear. An example of a bid that gets announced by the media in the summer that was actually done in the March. Okay, that I don't have one off the top of my head, Terry. I don't, I don't know, I don't remember everything in world football. But you said it happens all the time, so surely that you'd at least remember one if it happens that regularly. I'd have to look it up. I don't remember things too well. But when it comes to, but when it comes to, <laughs> I'm just being honest. But when it comes to, but when it comes to, what do you call it? Um, transfers. We see this all the time. Look what? at Newcastle the other day. They yeah. said they basically uh, spoon-fed news that they completed a fifty million pound uh, deal with. Barella, but it's not remotely true. Yeah, so so they're, 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 whatever they're, makes you sleep at night, mate. Okay, whatever again, makes you sleep at night. Yeah, mate. again, but when you read the story, with, with the art, the, the headline said Newcastle closing in on a fifty million pound deal. When you read the story, it didn't say that. It was a little bit clickbait bait, bait in the end. This is different. The headline and the story is an official bid has been made. 
you don't have a, you just said again, it happens all the time, but you don't have a single example of, 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 of what you've said that this is three months old news being posted out. Now I want to go to some of the super chats and I'll come back to you, Brandon. This here says, uh, Egal waffles so much painful to listen to him. <laughs> what, uh, what said here? No, you're funny, man. You're funny. <laughs> uh, I find it funny. I don't find it painful. It's brilliant. Uh, we ain't paying 60 million for Havertz, I can assure you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Tony says, let the bidding wars begin. And, and that does feel like what is about to start um, happening here. Uh, groundwork means nothing. Tottenham did groundwork and a medical for William just for Chelsea to sign him. That's very, very true. Uh, every single team low balls their first offer. It's it is it's not unusual. City uh, bid low for Kukurea last season. Many examples. Chelsea with Enzo, etc. That's true. But you need to be yeah, careful. But City didn't get Kukurea, so you, you know that's, that's City true. might have low balled, yeah, but they didn't end up getting him. So that that don't make no sense. Uh, this is as he gal the world isn't flat, and there's no Illuminati, as what said there. Uh, did he just say just to mess with it with them? Yes, just to mess with us, the fans. They do it. They've got we're like the pipe, they're like the pied piper. Uh waffle is one hell of a drug. What do you put in your waffles, the gal? Is it syrup, ice cream? What is it you like? Canadian <laughs> maple, maple syrup, syrup. Maple, maple syrup. Hundred percent. Have you had chicken and waffles? I have had chicken. I've had I've had chicken and waffles and duck and waffles. Both are very good. Nice. Uh, negotiating for six months and still submitted a low ball bid, yet considering to overpay for a Chelsea flop. Incompetence is an understatement. You agree with that, Brandon? Yes, yes. This is this is exactly what I was about to say, right? This is why Arsenal were poor, poor, poor negotiators. We've been chasing Declan Rice for six months, right? And if you want to drive that price down, the best thing that Arsenal could have done is bid for Caicedo at the same time and say, look, if, if you're not accepting what we want to pay for Rice, that's fine. We'll go get Caicedo instead. But instead, Arsenal have allowed it to come out that we are willing to pay £60 million for Kai Havertz. Does anybody here really and truly think that West Ham are not sitting there going, Kai Havertz, £60 million? Well, we could at least get 120 for Declan Rice. And now that Manchester City are coming into the fold, it's exactly what they want, a bidding war. And guess what? Arsenal don't do bidding wars. Uh, Just this, saying. This here from Redneck Blue uh, says, Egal, you are absolutely right. It's all circuses and <laughs> you are the biggest clown. Is what Red <laughs> so this, this one's back Big up Alex. Big up Alex. <laughs> this one's back in Egal. It says, Egal speaking the truth. Stop being so rude to him. He was told this in confidence by the Tooth Fairy and Bob <laughs> Tunnel. <laughs> Yo, Pac-Man, man. Come on, man. Oh, my God. He, he's coming for you today. <laughs> the gal waffled so much that Neeks uh, got his uh, ro rolls redone in that time. <laughs> I like it. I, like it. I, like it. Uh, I wonder if a gal was going to say it's BS when Romero says, here we Romano. go. Romano says, Listen, here we go. I honestly think Fabrizio Romano gives the biggest fake updates. He just says nothing's changed in an update. Well, that's not fake then, is it? <laughs> no, but like he he just he just says the same sentence from two weeks ago and the same in the same uh, in the same format. Uh, you, got, you have too many conspiracy theories today. What's it's not a on? conspiracy when it's true. Uh, hang on, someone's got proof that you're right, Egal. Breaking news has just come out. It says Man United have just bid twenty million for a sixteen-year-old Harland. <laughs> That's oh, slow slow sports news. No, but Terry, be honest. How many times have Manchester United news from three weeks ago resurfaced? And you're like, I reported this two weeks ago. Yeah, like, so I don't even always think it's resurfaces. So I'll give you an example, right? We'll, we'll come back to this one in a minute. So Dean Jones said four weeks ago in an article on Gibby Sport that City will come in for Rice. The story's come out again today. It wasn't, um, it was Ornstein. That's not like old news being pushed out. It's just when a certain journalist wants to say it or when a certain journalist has been told it. Like, it isn't so much, it is old news because other people have said it. But it's kind of the way that it works, you know. It depends on if, if another person's source has said it. That's uh, what it, I'm saying. Okay. It, it Gal should admit Lee Gunner is right. Uh, Phillips incoming. Do you no, think he's wrong about everything. Lee Gunner's, Lee Gunner's wrong about everything. There you go. Mate, you didn't should go head to head again. Have you, have you called down up from the last one? Listen, we'll talk about that after show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this year says why when we talk about Arsenal does logic go out the window and it become a ne negative in every walk of life 
You lowball your first offer. Let's not stop acting like business gurus. Listen, I agree that you often lowball. I agree. What I'm saying is now that City are interested, don't take any risk. Get out of the water. Like I love, I love going in the ocean. I love it. I love going snorkeling. I love looking at all the fishies. I love it. I go out by myself. I'm out there for hours, hours just snorkeling. But if somebody says there's a shark around, I'm out the water straight away. I don't sit in there paddling around thinking I'm going to be okay. Because we all saw what happened to that that poor Egyptian. Or no, I think he was a Russian in, a, Russian in, in Egypt. Yeah. Like we yeah, saw what happened. Was... Get out the water. So, uh, uh, Gunnar, uh, I understand. But you've got to act quick. And you are acting quick. You put another bid in tonight. Because you know... Henry, the transfer window just opened yesterday. <laughs> for God's sakes, this is unheard of. McAllister was announced before the transfer window. No, but for... Just, just under, you no, know. This transfer window, is it me? Or is this the quickest every club is moving for transfers? Because I've never seen Chelsea move this fast for players. <laughs> I've never well, my seen club Arsenal. isn't even sold, so I would say no for us. <laughs> like, it's pretty you can't quick. sell our freaking club. It, it, I think deep down, Egal, I think you're so worried. That's why you're trying to make, like, you're really comforting. It's a projection. He's trying to, he's trying projection. to convince I, 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 I really, really think, yeah. seriously, yeah. Egal, you're really worried about this Man City <laughs> lose today. <laughs> that you're really thinking, I got to sleep well at night. We already brother, finished. Brother. I, I, am, I am sleeping pretty. I don't need to worry about that. Let me, let me ask you guys a question. Let me, I'll go around. Who thinks... Man City are going to get this guy. Who thinks Man City are going to take him from Arsenal? I think if, if Arsenal delay and do what we've, we've what we've seen from them, you know, over the years, then I think City have a big chance. Like Mo said, when City come knocking these days, you, you can't turn them down, man. You you cannot turn them down. Um, but I do I do still think Arsenal are the favourites, man. You just need to get that done ASAP. But yeah, if you keep delaying and way. going back, if and City won Declan City Rice, they will get Declan Rice. Let me just put it this way: if City won Declan I Rice, so they will get Declan Rice. Do you I think, think they so. want him as their first choice? I think it's in Arsenal's hands. I think it's in Arsenal's hands, though. It but, is in their hands, until, but... Until, like, until, Don, until City want him. But but, but this is why what Terry said was right. This is why what... Sorry, Mo. This is what I was going to say. This is why what Terry said was right. Because if they would have done this deal already, like they told us it would be done as soon as the conference league is over and got him, City would have never snooped in. But because it's taken this long... And they now, like, all right, they, they were busy. These guys were busy, and now they have nothing going on. They're like, all right, let's go see what's going on in the in the transfer market while we were busy with, with our treble. And they go in, and they see Declan Rice is still not confirmed. And they're like, all right, there's definitely a chance there because it's not done inst- until it's yeah. done. And this is why I tell you, keep saying, you got to get out of the water quick because the longer you take, the longer people can snoop in. First, you heard about Bayern. You heard about United. Now you're hearing about City. These, these, these options are possible, which is what we're trying to tell you. It's incompetent to take this long with a player that you've been negotiating with since January. You didn't just hop in for him. You've been negotiating for about six months right now, and it shouldn't take this long. And you know what? I, 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 would, I, would, understand. I, would, understand, I would understand you saying, Miguel, that you're not worried if this was like a one-off transfer and Arsenal tend, you know, normally move quite quick in the transfer window. We're renowned for doing this crap over and over and over and over again. So there, there is an opportunity yeah. there for Man City. Brendan, don't say that. I might call you an Arsenal hater. I think City are interested in Declan Rice, but I don't think their interest is that serious in the sense of... Oh, I think it is. It's, no, but it's a case of if Calvin Phillips goes, yeah, we're going to get Declan Rice. But I think they're looking at, obviously, Coventry. They're actually trying to re-sign Thank you. Um, Gundogan on a... On a okay. One, so... One second, one second. And I think, where, I think West Ham have leaked this information that City have made, maybe tentative inquiries, maybe about the price or yeah, Arsenal. Like interested, because they know that Arsenal are heavily interested. And if Arsenal know that City are interested, they're going to come back very quickly with a more serious offer, which they let have me, not done. Let, let me ask you this then, Neeks, right? Because you're talking about Phillips and that, right? West Ham's um, chairman said that they would need multiple players to be able to uh, replace Declan Rice. Man City have something that Arsenal don't. They could offer Phillips as part of the deal for Declan Rice. West that might, might that might be more appealing to West Ham. Do you know you what I mean? Nelly and Lokonga, you know what I mean? You could do that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a very good point. I agree what Neek just said. I no, think it's it's early right now. They've got to be mindful. I've got some more super chats here. This one says, "Yeah, today was a day." where Arsenal went from contenders back to being a banter club. Why stop at Havarts? Why don't uh, we get Lukaku and all the other Chelsea duds? Edu and Garlic, you man, need to leave. You know what it is, Terry? I was saying this earlier. Arsenal <clears> are treating <throat> Chelsea like it's a talk shop. 
Like, they're coming back for all of our players time and time again. I don't know yeah. what's going on with you guys. <laughs> Emmanuel here says, uh, I lied. Copium is the drug for Egal. Uh, I'm with Egal. Uh, this club will make me crazy as well, <laughs> is what my, my guy says here. Uh, the same fans moaning about taking too long on signings complain about price tags being overinflated. Uh, uh, Qatar Chester United will make this worse. I like that, Qatar Chester. I'm, I might even adopt that. I like that. Thank you, bro. Uh, Kai Havertz, I'm surprised nobody wants him. Well, as in fans, you mean? Yeah, clubs definitely do. Barca dodged the bullet not signing him. Um, when Chelsea or Man United come to the table, prices go up 30%. Well, that's what happens when you overpay for people too regularly. Uh, people stick a premium on there. Uh, this year says, where is the long-term vision of the owners? The problem with football fans today is they all they see is the immediate term. Roman was good, but since 2015, had a horrible scouting. So much dead wood at Chelsea. Miguel, thank you for that super chat, bro. That means a great deal to us. Uh, this year says, Bowley is so good. He and his fans. I've oh, already done that one. Actually, already done that one from Anthony. Uh, is an interesting question for the panel. Where will Mbappe play if Arsenal sign Havertz? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you, like guys get, you guys get Qatari owners. He's going to Manchester United, and that's really the only landing spot. I, I, I genuinely believe if Man United get taken over by Qatar, we'll get Mbappe. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, you, you know, know why. why. You genuinely know why. The Qatar like connection. Because, they don't because... want to sell to Real Madrid. The only cra the craziest thing is he's going to be getting... He's, this is going to be the cra the most craziest wage in, in Premier League history. He's going to get like 800k a week or something. Crazy like that. You say that, but Haaland's probably on 800k a week. We just don't know it, so... Yeah, uh, well, Man, Man United will do with Mbappe what City do with Haaland. It will be 250, 300 based from the club, and then they'll have big image right contracts. But most of that will be done by Qatar, Qatar as a country. Guaranteed. It'll become an ambassador. I, 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 I think, yeah. I, I think I think PSG, if we get Qatari owners, I think PSG will be happy Hold. enough to sell. Yeah, Hold. basically to sell. To us. Hold. You know what it is? You know what it is? The, fo the football fans. Because they're keeping him in house. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The so, football fan in me wants to. It'll be interesting to see like Mbappe and Haaland up against each other in Manchester. We need it. And we, we had Messi and Ronaldo good, yeah. for ten years. We need Haaland and Mbappe in the Premier League. As a rival, thought, uh, he needs to go I, Madrid. I man. thought he was going to say Madrid. Mbappe and Haaland in the same team. No, no we don't want to see that. They'll be in the same city. That's close enough. Same city. Same city. Same city. Are you seriously going willing? Sorry, are you seriously going? Seriously going willing to learn from the water boy uh, than the master. I'll say, uh, I will take Pep over Arteta. No, it's not about taking Pep over Arteta. It's about looking at the two teams and saying to yourself, do you do you want to go to Manchester City and potentially go there and then be uh, have a situation where you're going to have to fight for your place and, and you're not going to be guaranteed a spot, but yes, you're going to pick up silverware every single which way and, and back yourself, or you come to Arsenal, you'd be one of the main men to get us uh, to get us back into the uh, Premier League title race again. City so, ain't spending over 100 million on Rice to bench him. He's going to start. Listen, I've seen Mahrez on the bench. I've seen listen, Sterling on the bench. I've seen big yeah. names on the bench. Rice is going for Man City. City, Rice is going for Man City. If there's one thing we know about City, City put a lot of the money up front in cash, and they usually get deals a lot cheaper than other people. If they were going to come in for Declan Rice, West Ham, they don't care about having money up front. They just want the highest bidder. So in that case, I think wait, we do wait. have an advantage over City. No, 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 no. I don't know where you got that from. I don't know if you spoke to one of the Davids, the one who's alive. Well, you know, I can't remember. I don't want to get it wrong. But who, how have you come to the conclusion that City, Chelsea, um, West Ham don't want the more cash up front? If you say 100 million over five years and City say 90 million cash up front, I think they're taking the 90 million cash up front. Uh the cash up front. I don't, I don't think City are gonna go, keep that much. No, money. I'm just yeah, saying. But you're, you're, you're saying yeah, they don't. Want cash up front. I, I don't know what you got. I'm a nature, right. You're right. Nine million today is worth more than ninety million in five years because of things like inflation, hundred percent football inflation. So, I that, I, also as well, it's gonna take more than one player to uh, Sullivan himself. I think it's Sullivan that is still like, yeah. I think David Gold passed away. Okay. Um, I could get that really wrong now, and I really apologize if anybody's offended. But he said on Talk Sport the other day, we need to buy a replacement, if not multiple replacements. If you've whoever they whatever they're sold for, they're going to try and strike West Ham up because they know they've got money, right? So if they don't have the cash in their bank, it's harder for them to do those deals because they've got to put two or three um, 
uh, installment pr process in play. If they have the cash, they're still going to get strapped up on price, but at least they have it there, cash ready to pay. So, yeah, that's a very interesting point you make there, Nix. Uh, Terry, do you think Neymar is going to Newcastle? Why are Man United not pushing uh, Harry for, for Harry Kane? Uh, we have There's no point pushing for Harry Kane if they're saying not for sale at under £130 million. Pounds. That's stupid money when he's available free next year. Um, we will be looking at a DM. Caicedo is on our list as an example. And will Neymar go to Newcastle? No, not in my opinion. I don't think he's right for Newcastle. They don't need a player like him who's available for 16 games a season. It's going to eat up a massive amount of their wages and transfer fee. So, yeah, I don't see that one happening personally. Debbie, um, boys, I want to say a big thank you to all of you coming on the show today. And that was short-lived from your point of view, Staffy. But I actually want to ask Staffy before the end, thoughts on the Man United takeover? I will say quickly, there's a BBC Newsnight correspondent that's come out and said... Uh, the share price um, is a bit like the barometer of the likelihood of Qatari victory because the Qatari bid includes buying the New York listed shares. Uh, when you see the share price going up, uh, that's a sign uh, that the market believes they're going to get it. It's exactly what I've been saying. I'm not an expert, but I spoke to people at the bank. And essentially, remember when the Qataris buy it, within a month of being accepted, they'll be buying everybody's shares. They've got more money than God. So everybody's going to keep investing so that they make money. I'm not going to say how much, but I invested in Bar Man United shares t two days ago. And it's already going up nicely. So I hope they get it. Um, but what's your take on the, the uh, uh, what is your, your thoughts on the takeover, Staffy? Do you feel like it's looking like it's the Qataris now? 100%. 100%. I keep saying there's no, uh, there's no smoke without a fire. And for all these news to come out today, I mean, I, I granted all of them were getting denied right away by, um, um, by reliable reporters uh, like Ben Jacobs and whoever else. But I do think there's a reason all this is coming out today. Even Rio Ferdinand came out today and spoke out of out of nowhere. Like, since when has Rio said anything on this? You know, so I think all this is happening today for a reason. You know, I've been speculating for a few days now that they already know who's who's taken over the, the club. I think they already accepted a bid, but nothing will be official yet until they come out and they decide to announce it. So obviously, as a United fan, I'm being optimistic, which is why I'm saying this, because I do want it to happen. So... Um, I'm going to stay optimistic as, as much as I can. KJ has been trying to keep me grounded, but let me let me tell you something, KJ. I know you're in the background. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I, I'm going to celebrate this. I already changed my Twitter name to Sheikh Stafi, and I'm going to stay like that because the Qataris are coming in. So <laughs> this I, is I my like thing. It. I like it. Uh, listen, viewers, do us a big, big favor and hit the like button before you leave. Make sure you're subscribing and got bell notifications turned on as well. Gentlemen, it's always a pleasure. Um, until next time, everybody, take care. Goodbye. God bless. And we'll see you all again 